have with us another outstanding expert in the study of the human factors involved in the space venture. He is Colonel Rufus R. Hesburgh, Chief of the Biophysics Branch of the Aeromedical Laboratory of the Wright Air Development Center. Good evening, Colonel Hesburgh. Very nice to have you on our program this evening after having your associate last week, uh, uh, Colonel Bollarder. Last week, he uh, sort of helped us take vicariously a little trip into space in terms of the human factors, which are studied by the simulators and various other projects that you have at the Aeromedical Laboratory. We saw something of the problems of blasting off and entering space and staying up there for a little while. Uh, now, what can you tell us this evening about the problems from the human point of view which will be encountered in plunging back into the Earth's atmosphere. I think you call it re-entry. Well, in the re-entry problem, uh, there are several factors, uh, some of which are the heat problem, uh, performance, control, and deceleration. Uh, as man comes back in his spaceship from the vacuum of the space environment into the denser atmosphere that we live in here on Earth, he slowed down from 18,000 miles an hour to 180 miles an hour. And this is the same as putting your foot on the brake in your car, lunging forward. It's quite an impact on the human body. Quite a problem just in slowing down to come back home. Well, how do you study this uh, uh, problem of deceleration? Well, when we have identified a, an area that is a problem to the pilot in a spaceship, uh, we isolate this problem, and then we take it to uh, the laboratory facility where we do everything in our power to reduplicate just what man is going to experience. We uh, do this with the human centrifuge. And we set the man up on the centrifuge just as he would experience uh, this if it were the true thing, coming back from space and re-entering and slowing down. As you see here, we've set a man up ready to experience this. Uh, <coughs> well, tell us a little bit about uh, the conditions under which you stage this uh, test, and then we'll take a look at it, actually. All right. Well, we have the man facing out on the human centrifuge towards the wall of the room so that he'll be forced out from his seat, getting the same force that you would get if you stopped your car suddenly. Mm. And uh, here's a curious thing. If you'll notice, this is something we didn't know beforehand. Uh, the harness is a bit off-center to the right, and we'll see a little bit later just what this uh, did. What that caused. Okay, let's take a look at at this test uh, on motion picture film now. You can almost see you there at the end going, <laughs> I suppose you felt a little that way. I was glad it was over. <laughs> Let's take a look at this picture again in this uh, uh, condition you mentioned of the off-center harness and uh, find out what the significance of that was. Well, I think we have another picture that may show us uh, exactly what uh, happened as a result of this. Uh, if you'll notice, the foot on your left as you look at this, the uh, subject's right foot is darker than the other. And this was due to uh, a lot of little small hemorrhages in the skin where little blood vessels had ruptured and had uh, discolored the skin. It looked like a measles rash somewhat. Hmm. And there were some in the left foot, but they were not as many or as severe as the ones in the right. Well, why does this happen, uh, Colonel? Uh, first of all, uh, why was it more on the one foot than the other? And and why do these little blood vessels burst like that? Well, this was the same question we asked ourselves, and uh, we have a way of doing that, too. The reason, as it turned out, that it was worse on the right was because of the <coughs> harness off on the right, causing sort of a tourniquet effect on the right leg uh, and made it more severe than the left. But this was something we didn't know till after the run. Mm -hmm. I suppose you have, by now, uh, affected a solution to the problem that you have uh, discovered in this series of tests. Uh, absolutely. Faced with this problem, we then went to the drawing boards, as the engineers say, and came up with a restraint suit, which uh, gives you pressure as well as holding you well back into that seat so that you don't float out away from it. And this has kept the pain down and uh, any of the hemorrhage. As an example, the run we just saw there was 5G for 15 seconds, and last week one of our volunteer riders went to 8G for a minute and a half. Oh, a great and deal more for us. And much more pleasant. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you, Colonel Hesburgh. We'll come back to the Colonel for the rest of this story in just a few moments. But right now, let's turn to Motordom's masterpiece, the 1958 Cadillac.
Now let's find out a little bit more about uh, Colonel Hesburgh uh, personally and uh, more about his work. Uh, first of all, I, I think our viewers would probably want to ask this question. Colonel, in terms of the strictly the human factors or the life sciences, uh, how long can we now sustain a man in space? The human environment support uh, would now be about six hours. We can support a man in true space for six hours. Uh, as the time goes up, the problems increase. And this is the place where we still have a lot of work to do because the longer that they want to keep a man in space, the more work we're going to have to do to support it. Uh, how long uh, have you actually been in this type of work yourself? I've been in air, uh, aviation medicine uh, for 10 years. Now, do you think that, uh, in say, within uh, your lifetime and mine, it will be uh, a reasonable expectation that space travel will be a fairly common experience? Well, I certainly think so and hope so. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Hesburgh, for being our guest this evening. And thank you also for being willing to share with us the personal experiences in this kind of testing for space travel.